Good day everyone. Scooter coming to you live from the Granville Guitars World Headquarters here in lovely St. Petersburg, Florida. Today is May. Actually it's not May anymore. It's June the 1st, 2019. Um, embarking on a little restoration project here. We have a 1975 Fender Vibrolux Reverb Amplifier. I'm going to zoom in here a little bit. She's pretty rough. Um, a lot of dirt, a lot of corrosion. Um, there is, as we'll see here in just a second, um, there's some problems with the cabinet that's going to have to be addressed. Uh, let's talk about that right away. Um, if you, you know, it's worse on this side down here, you can see it better. It's doing this on both sides of the cabinet. If we peel away where the Tolex has come away, you can see there's a there's a huge gap right in here. So uh, we're going to have to, um, this is actually kind of tricky how this has to be done. I'm going to have to remove this, this flap of Tolex all the way to the back and oh, see how open that is all the way. I'm thinking it probably opened up all the way down and the Tolex is probably all that's keeping it intact. And then uh, we need to clean out all the old glue residue, re-glue it, and clamp it up. <clears throat> uh, that's not major. And there's more than enough of the original Tolex here that can be tucked back under carefully. And it should look pretty close to original when I'm done with it, is the hope. Uh, if I'm careful, we'll, we'll see how that works out. As you can see, the front panel is is got, it's not too bad. It's mostly just got, you know, patina and schmutz on it, which should clean up pretty well. Um, original gr grill cloth, original uh, logo badge is in place without the, uh, the line underneath, as you would expect for 1975. Uh, blue markings around the, the uh, controls. There's no pull boost and there's no master volume. Um, it's not into that area yet. Uh, if we look around the side, we can see the sides of the cabinet are fairly dusty and crusty as well. And uh, are going to need to be cleaned up with my patented Windex and vegetable brush process. Which uh, generally yields pretty good results. Um, as we come around to the back, we can see uh, there's a number of fun features here. The original warning tag is still in place on the original cable. Let's zoom in here so you can see this thing. This was placed there by Fender because in 1975, um, the majority of households in, in America still had two wire uh, household wiring without a grounded wire. And the three prong plug was a new thing on the scene at that point and this tag warns you not to destroy that three prong uh, cable and fortunately for us on this example the cable is quite dirty but the uh, the three prongs are still intact and and this original cable is actually still in pretty good shape uh, this amp can is in pretty good condition but it's really dirty it's just got dust and uh, neglect all over it. It's been stored obviously for a long period of time and uh, anyway uh, we'll look at the top of the cabinet here real quick we can see that it's um, it's got a, a lot of uh, storage uh, on it um, dust, humidity, that kind of stuff uh, little white marks everywhere all that sort of thing is going to have to get cleaned off um, and usually comes off pretty well like I said with with Windex and a vegetable brush warning sticker is still intact uh, that would have been there during the CBS era which is this is definitely within the CBS era um, I'm gonna take uh, the back covers off it like I said we've established this is a 1975 and I'll show you here in a second why that is um, let's take the back off. Okay, here we are in the back of this jewel. Um, as we can see, we have the original 
uh, eminence manufactured uh, speakers 10 inch speakers that would have been in this amp now I'm going to modify my previous statement I had not dated these speakers when I said this was a 75 if these are the original speakers they're 70 this amp is a 76 okay as we can see right here this 67 is the manufacturer's code that's eminence the 76 is the year and 06 is the week of that year. This is slightly different than from other manufacturer speakers. Typically you'll have a manufacturer's code and this number would be the second number of the year. But in the case of eminent speakers of this vintage, this code designates eminence. The next two digits are the year and the last two digits of this grouping of four is the week of that year. So this man speaker was manufactured by eminence in 1976, the sixth week of that year, in February that would be, I think. Uh, the other speaker has its code on the underside of the magnet, and it's also 67-7606. So those speakers were manufactured at the same time. <clears throat> so this amp could pr is more than likely a 76 if those speakers are original. The reason that I said it was 75 is because I did open it up earlier and examine it when it first came into the shop and the transformer dates are all 75. Uh, so I figured it was a 75. Th this is a lesson right here. Um, you have to take into account the totality of all of these numbers when trying to uh, assign a date, uh, a year of manufacturer to an amplifier. Okay, now as we look in the back of the amp here, we can see that, are these the original tubes? Certainly possible. The tube chart is missing, unfortunately. It's one of the few things that's a bummer about this amp. Um, as we'll see once it's open, it's completely original. Uh, these tubes could potentially be the original tubes. Uh, we can see uh, right there, that is uh, an RCA... Uh, it says 5R4. That's interesting. That should be a 5U4. That's probably not original <coughs> and probably not uh, right. We'll, we'll address that. Um, we've got an old pair of GE uh, 6L6 short bottles, one of which has a broken keyway. Actually, they're Sylvanias, aren't they? Yeah, GE Sylvania. Most of the television companies in that period were very incestuous and would rebrand one another's tubes all the time. Now, let's real quick here. I've already had these shields off, so I know these tubes are all old vintage RCAs. Every single one of them could potentially be the original tubes. Uh, the owner of this amp told me that he, uh, he had never done anything to it. It had never ever been serviced. It's been in storage for quite some time now, but it's, it's been played and used, and, but it's been in storage. But we've got nothing but RCAs in there. Um, I'm going to pull the chassis and let you have a look inside, and we'll see why I haven't heard it yet. All right, we can see the tubes a little better now. The tubes that are in it, hopefully some of them are good. V1, we have an RCA 7025. Probably the best preamp tube ever made, in my opinion. Uh, the RCA 7025 just always sounds great, particularly in a Fender amp to my ear that's that's usually the best choice and that to me would include telefunkins and bugle boys and a ton of other really great tubes i just always like the rca 7025 in that position where it's supposed to be v2 another rca 7025 um, and the 7025 is a mil spec 12ax7 uh, it's supposed to be quieter and a little more uh, durable uh, as I understand it, not necessarily a, a difference in gain, but uh, I just think I just feel like they sound better. It might be in my head, you know, because hearing is the worst sense memory they tell us. So 
it's entirely possible. Okay, V3 here, which is your reverb driver tube. This is also an RCA, and it's a 12AT7. Now, if we look closely, the RCA logo is quite scorched off. That means this tube has been hot a lot of its life. Not unusual in silver faces, particularly ones that haven't had their circuitry modified uh, in the reverb section for blackface purposes. There was a, a, a resistor and cap in parallel that they replaced with, with simply with a, a resistor and it was a bad idea and it runs that tube really hot. So I always change that circuit aspect when I find it. Down to V4 we got our gain recovery makeup tube here. It's another RCA 12AX7. Another fine vintage tube. Um, like I said, I have I have not plugged this amp in, so I have no idea what it sounds like. Some of these tubes may be bad. I'm assuming all of them are going to be at least microphonic. V5, another RCA 12AX7. Um, looks really excellent. Um, these these definitely could have been changed along its life. Matter of fact, more than likely, some of them were. But <clears throat> if they were changed, they were changed a long time ago. Uh, and last but le not least, uh, 12AT7 in the driver section, also an RCA. So we have a whole bunch of RCA tubes here, um, as expected. And uh, let's have a, a little peek at the transformers, and then I'm going to flip it around to the other side so we can look at our filter caps and show you why I have not powered this amp up. If we zoom in here to our output transformer, what the heck, I'm going to flip it around here so you can actually read the number. There we go. There is our output transformer right there. And uh, we can see, well, I'm going to go all the way here. I'm going to get out my list. One second. Okay, uh, let's concentrate on the, uh, on the date code there. And this is what led me to say 75 initially, and we'll see in a minute why it was wrong, not just the speakers. This amp is a 76, and we'll see that here. 606 is your manufacturer's code. 5 is the second digit of the year, so this is a 75, and it was made in the 19th week of the year, um, fairly early on in the year. Uh, these transformers were all manufactured in 75, the three of them that are here or actually four of them. The reverb transformer is also a 75. Uh, they're all 75s, but they vary widely in the weeks that they were made. The reverb transformer was made in the 21st week. Output transformer was made in the 5th week. Choke was made in the 5th week. But the power transformer was made in the 50th week of the year, towards the end of the year. Now, if we look closer up there, you see that code, that 022848, okay? That corresponds to, um, let's see here, Vibrolux Reverb. That's the output transformer. Uh, in a vintage one, let's see here. It should have been a 125A6A. We're going to look that up corresponding-wise. Uh, as of 1960, that would be 022848, and that's what we have here. That's a 4-ohm, 40-watt output transformer. So this amplifier's primary impedance is a 4-ohm output. That's, that's the only impedance that it has, one speaker impedance, so it's 4 ohms. Now let's see here if I can get a good angle on the, on the choke, and hopefully it will focus eventually here. No, it's going to sit there and laugh at me. Not surprisingly. There we go. 606-5-43. That was the 43rd week. Very late in the year. Um, but that was 75. Now, the choke in, in that Vibrolux reverb is the 125C3A. And let's see, its code should be 022707, and that's what it is. That's correct. <clears throat> um, yeah, now we're going to swing this around to the other side of the chassis. <clears throat> 
so we can have a look at the power transformer and look at its code properly. Hopefully, I eh, always get the zoom wrong the first time. All right. There she blows. Now that CSA code, that's the Canadian Safety Administration, I believe, which designates this as an international power supply transformer. So that means that it's got wires available to rewire this for international voltages, I think. I hope I'm remembering that correct. Uh, the power transformer in this amplifier should be the 125P26A, and that corresponds to a number on top. Uh, let's see, 125P26A. <laughs> One two five P twenty six A. There it is. That code should be O two two seven two three, and it is with an L in front of it. Uh, again, manufacturer code six zero six five for seventy five fifty for the fiftieth week. So this amplifier, I think those speakers that we saw earlier are probably original, the 1965, or the 1976 eminent speakers that we saw earlier. I believe those are original to this amp, and that this amp is actually a 1976. Now, as we come over here, we're going to see why I did not power the amplifier up when it came in. Um, if we look here at the main filter caps, you're going to see a whole lot of ugly going on here. Um, let me get some better light here. <clears throat> These are all positives in this amp, uh, on this end, similar to what you'd see in a deluxe reverb. One of the differences with the deluxe reverb is you have a great deal more powerful output transformer and more powerful power transformer, uh, among other small differences. But uh, as you can see, we've got a burst right here. This is what the cap should look like if it's not burst. Uh, it should it should be clean and free of stains or discoloration, although this one's starting to swell a little bit. This one has full-on burst out. It's, it's actually exploded. It's called a popcorn burst. Uh, this one has one beginning right there. This one has one starting right there. And this one on the end has full-on blown out. So... Uh, we have to have new filter caps in this thing before I can power it up and it's a simple job it's a job I do here all the time and uh, once we got those in <clears throat> we'll be able to power it up let's have a quick peek inside the amplifier all right now we're looking at the inside here and I've missed my guess on the uh, international nature of this power transformer there are no wires that are uh, extra or tied off anywhere here so uh, this uh, this transformer has just got a CSA designation on it for whatever reason um, by this time Fender was buying parts that would work in all areas of the world rather than separate parts for different areas of the world so yeah, my, my thought is that this could probably have been rewired for different uh, areas of the world but I guess not because there's no additional wires anywhere uh, if we look up there, we can see our bias supply board. Uh, it's got the old molded Mallory uh, 80 UF at 75 volts. That's going to get changed out. We can see just by looking here, the configuration of the, uh, of the bias supply is one of a balance control. I'll be redoing that to a proper uh, bias control. Uh, that will adjust overall bias rather than balance between the two. Um, that's usually the way it's done. Uh, it needs to be done that way. <clears throat> so, um, and as we uh, as we pan across the the amp, we can see it's all original. Nothing has ever been touched in here, which is always fun. Um, it's it's nice to see. Um, you know older pieces even if you don't consider this to be a you know a, a desirable vintage piece it's nice to see older amplifiers that are in original condition um, if not, as nothing else uh, than an educating tool um, 
you know I like I like to learn as much as I possibly can about this stuff every day and uh, it's interesting to see uh, how things were done and kind of you know try to suppose why they were done a certain way um, you know you th these are the the blue uh, capacitors in there the blue uh, uh, polypropylene capacitors that are not necessarily bad but I've I've heard plenty of amplifiers with these in there that sound great the ones that I don't like are the cat turds the the brown chalky looking ones those hardly ever sound good but I have been proven wrong on a number of occasions so yeah we've got our output coupling capacitors right here and here uh, phase inverter plate resistors down here and we see the silver face values of let me get down in there so you can see them a little better hopefully we've got those values of 47k which is what you would typically see on a silver face uh, I've seen these sound great and I've I've had them sound not so great and replaced them typical black face values are actually 100k here and 82k here uh, the bias splitter resistors that usually live up in this area have been removed well not they haven't been removed they've been omitted and reconfigured one is here and one's back over here uh, they're both 100 K's and uh, on a black face they're 220 typically what I'll do with a silver face is listen to it uh, I'll redo the bias supply to be a true bias supply as I mentioned earlier and then I'll leave these guys alone initially and listen to the amplifier and see how it sounds and if it sounds fine, then I kind of leave it alone, usually. Um, now we're getting up in here. Uh, let's see here. Uh, here's your negative feedback stuff. <clears throat> uh, phase inverter bias resistors right here. Uh, your long-tailed pair is down here. Uh, let's bend this cap out of the way so you can see these. Um, I'm talking about this three here. This arrangement here is called the long-tailed pair. Um, a phase inverter cathode resistor is right here. And a phase inverter grid resistors uh, here and here. And usually in a black face, uh, these two are 1 meg. And this one is 470. Uh, these two are 330K in this amp. Um, those will probably be getting changed but again I'm gonna to listen to the amplifier and let it tell me what it wants and if if those sound fine I'm gonna leave them alone uh, as we pass through the amplifier here you're gonna see the uh, the caps that are responsible for the uh, uh, vibrato network um, all in through here uh, or tremolo as it's probably better recalled um, Reverb circuitry recovery stuff is all in here. Um, reverb recovery plate resistors. Whoops, I gotta move the, the camera. I've already moved ahead. Um, then up here we got uh, vibrato channel preamp plate resistors. These are of good quality. Sometimes these old carbon comps will get noisy and they have to be replaced. But I'm gonna leave them in place if, if I can. Now, I mentioned earlier the, the reverb, uh, let's see here, you notice right here where I'm pointing, okay, there's one resistor, that I believe is a 470 ohm resistor. Typically in a black face you have a 2.2K bypassed with a 25 microfarad. This arrangement right here will run that that reverb driver tubes extremely hot and you'll get into premature failure um, so that's going to get so-called black faced I'm not a fan of all of the black face changes that are typically made but this one gets ignored a lot and it has to happen the reverb will sound better and the components in that part of the circuit will last longer um, again as we pass through here uh, we see a whole bunch of uh, cathode resistor and capacitors that are uh, that are uh, original these uh, Mallory's here the white Mallory's um, towards the back of the chassis 
Uh, everything's original there with the uh, tube sockets and wiring and whatnot. Uh, pots are as near as I can see from here. Um, let's see if I can see any codes. Um, well, hmm. 13775. Volume pot in the normal channel is a 1975 date code. This one here. The treble potentiometer is replaced. I, no, no, no. Well, yeah, it might be replaced. I think it's been replaced. Um, I can't tell. Uh, the the base pot, however, let's see if I can get this out of the way and see the code. Yeah, the base pot's original. Um, and near as I could tell, I'd already looked at the other channels, potentiometers, and I'm seeing a whole lot of one three seven uh, seven five date codes on all of those pots so it looks like most of those bad boys are original too so it looks pretty much as it left the factory um, I usually in these old amps I usually like to replace the screen grids they add these capacitors uh, across uh, pin 8 and pin 5 uh, to <sighs> Presumably stabilize the amp, but it really kind of sucks a lot of tone. Um, let's see if I can zoom in here and get get uh, get a, a view of it for you. It's this it's this cap right here, this point double out two. It's a thousand volts too. Uh, that guy's been added there to stabilize that section a little better, but cleaning up the lead dress usually does that trick without this. Fender did an awful lot of stuff adding things to amplifiers to make them faster and easier to manufacture and uh, they could hire people to wire things that weren't necessarily that skilled at uh, wiring and could be taught easily uh, in the earlier days of Fender uh, you see very clean military style lead dress in a lot of cases and uh, that led to the amplifiers not having quite so many noise issues usually but it uh, takes a more practiced hand and it takes longer to make and um, yeah all of that so anyway uh, that pretty much covers the innards for now and uh, I'm gonna get some filter caps popped into this bad boy and uh, hopefully get it powered up and take some more readings and, and see exactly what may or may not be need to be replaced uh, gotta do some work on the power tube sockets I usually pull screen grid resistors out uh, just you know just because because they they get hammered hard let me see if I can zoom in here and show you what I'm talking about the screen grid resistor see if we can get some more light here that'll actually brighten it up is hidden behind this cap that I was pointing out on another tube socket it's a 470 ohm um, that is a two watt or a one watt resistor I'm sorry right here and um, these guys get hammered a lot over their lifetimes <clears throat> they sound really good but they really need to be more reliable at this stage in the game you got more voltage coming out of the wall and um, that particular spot gets smacked around a lot so those need to get replaced um, anyway um, that covers the innards for now and uh, I'll come back here to you when uh, I've completed my restoration work. Alright, um, it's taken me uh, almost two hours. Uh, I've been testing tubes and uh, doing a few other things here. Uh, filter cap job is finished. As we can see, I have used the F&T uh, 22 UF at 500 volt in place of the old 16 UFs. A uh, little, little extra capacitance never hurt in this amplifier and slightly higher voltage is good as well. Uh, this resistor between these two caps in this amp was a 2.2K uh, but the AA270 schematic calls for a 4.7K 
and I feel a little better about that in there so that was replaced and I just put another 10k uh, same resistor as what was in there let me zoom in so you can see what I'm talking about uh, right there uh, if you want to see the schematic I suppose I could go over to the computer here and show that off let's whiz over here real quick and uh, we'll have a look at what I'm talking about here um, it's the schematic for the AA270. While we're looking at the rectifier right there, uh, the original rectifier in this amp was, in fact, a 5U4GB. Um, the tube that's in it is a 5R4. Uh, same pinouts. Um, it's going to introduce a little more sag than a 5U4 uh, and probably draw a little more, but. I think it'll be all right just to get started with and then I'm probably going to end up ordering a 5U. Uh, the resistor that I was just pointing out uh, is right there. You can see where the uh, first three stages of filtering are. Um, right here is the first stage that comes in off the, uh, uh, the oh that's coming off V, what is that, V2. Yes. Yeah, it's it's coming off the preamp stage and it's meeting up here with a 10k 1 watt and then to another stage to ground. And right here you see 4.7k 1 watt. It it actually had a uh, a 2.2k 1 watt right there before the choke, which is that TR2 um, <clears throat> and the further filtering before getting to the standby switch. So that is why I've replaced that particular resistor with the 2.2K. Perfect timing. My, my screen went to the screensaver. Um, so that's why that was done. But as you can see, we've got all new filter supply caps. Love the F and T's. Uh, have vacillated back and forth between a number of different brands over the years. I use hundreds of these bad boys on a yearly basis. And uh, the F and T's are the ones that, that work the best. I have never had one fail me yet, Knockwood. Um, any other brand you can name, I have had failures either out of the box or shortly thereafter. And um, the F and T's just, just work best. Um, that's what I use exclusively in my shop pretty much in just about everything. Fenders, Marshalls, what have you. So there are your new filter caps. Uh, now I'm going to flip it over and... Uh, work on the inside a little bit okay well as I had hoped uh, all of the uh, all of the 12AX7 AT7 tubes have tested good and are back in the amp in the same place as they came out of uh, I have black faced if you will the uh, bias supply here if you can see it down there uh, that main bias supply cap as well as the secondary bias supply cap this one down here Change those out for F and T 100s at 100 left all the components in place and just rearranged them to make this an actual uh, bias adjustment rather than uh, a Balance you can't really see it there, but I've installed a couple of metal oxide 220 K's in there in place of the 100 K's other than that, I've not changed any values. I've left everything alone. Um, well, actually, that's not actually true. Uh, if we'll look at the power tube sockets here, I think we can see this one probably the best. i will try and get some light here. Um, <clears throat> uh, you can see that I have replaced the... Uh, the screen grid resistors and the grid stoppers. The screen grids are now, well, let's see here. You can't get above that with this tripod, so I'm going to go handheld here. There we go. Now you can see it. 500 ohm, 5 watt salt lick resistor. It's my preference in these amps. And a 1.5K grid stopper underneath. And uh, that little capacitor they use for stability is gone. Done that to both tube sockets. All right. Um, left everything else alone. Uh, in case you're wondering, 
the filament wires were in phase so I've resoldered them back to their original positions uh, all of this has been left alone all of the wiring for all of the tubes okay I have not yet changed the uh, reverb circuit over to the black face yet because I've not plugged it in it's still on the bench I've not heard the reverb circuit and I'm kinda running out of time for the day so that's gonna have to wait till uh, Monday but I have plugged it in and it sounds exquisite it's very representative of fenders in general uh, and fenders of the period since it does sound so good guess what see all those Mallory low voltage capacitors I'm gonna leave them I'm gonna leave them in place this thing is quiet as the grave uh, with those <clears throat> with those old RCA tubes and uh, all of this stuff if and I don't I don't immediately this is a soapbox just for a moment sports fans I don't immediately yank things out of an amplifier just because the component isn't what I would consider ideal um, I let my ears guide me in those matters and if something sounds good I'm gonna leave it alone now the reverb thing that I'm gonna change and you'll see that in the next video uh, which is oh I can't find my uh, my pointer there it is hang on sorry I'm all for <laughs> uh, right in here I'm gonna add a capacitor and change this resistor value um, that will cool off the reverb driver tube a little bit everything else is working real well the tremolo is working and sounds fantastic sorry to be such a tease you're not gonna hear it today um, you're gonna hear it in the next clip but I was excited to get this thing on the bench and get it running uh, the cabinet repairs that we talked about earlier on in this video have got to happen yet um, I was planning on clamping that thing up today however I do not have a clamp large enough to go around this cabinet so that's gonna have to wait as well have to make a trip to Home Depot and get myself a bar clamp that's large enough for the job uh, that's kind of the way it is so that's all we've got time for today uh, if you want to see the end of this stay tuned it's gonna be happening here probably early next week Tuesday or so maybe Monday I don't know um, tune back in to the Granville Guitars YouTube channel at that time and you will see part two of this video if you have any questions about anything we do here at Granville Guitars repairs custom amplifiers custom pedals any of that stuff uh, seek us out we're on the web at www.granvilleguitars.com we're also on Facebook and Instagram and also the blog of you from the Granville bench over at WordPress that's all we have for today. Stay tuned for part two.